Today is Mother's Day. Now, did anybody already do something special for their moms today? Anybody? What did you do? You got her a new water bottle. Cool. What else? What did you? Made a present at school. Okay. Made a card. Great. What did you do? Made mommy breakfast. Wow. So you guys already have done a whole bunch of nice things for mom today. Well, I remember this one time when my mom and I were oh, going to oh, be... Oh, 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 hey, 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 hey. Hey, Wally, how are you doing? Well, oh, hey, kids. Um, you guys want to say hi to, hi to Wally? Hi. Hey, Pastor Steph, Pastor yeah. Steph. Oh, guess what? What? It's Mother's Day. Yeah, I know. I was actually just talking to the kids about that and telling them that it's Mother's Day. Yeah, yeah, but what, what's really cool is that Mumsy is back from her holiday and we can open the candy store again. <laughs> Whoa! Did I just hear that your mother is back? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that she can reopen her candy store again? Mm. Oh boy, I can't wait to stock up on more trunk breakers. Trunk breakers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like jaw breakers, but you use your trunk to suck on them. So they're called trunk breakers. They come in candy floss, chocolate, nut, and grasshopper flavors. Mm, whoa. Have you guys ever heard of a trunk breaker? Yeah. Do any of those flavors sound yummy? How many would try a grasshopper flavored trunk breaker? Yeah, that's kind of kind of weird. Um, wow. I uh, don't think there's going to be much of a market for those things. Yeah. Well, Mumsy will definitely be selling trunk breakers. She even has brought, she even brought back an old favorite grass with hints of lemon and herb. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm actually really looking forward to seeing your mom. Do you guys want to see Wally's mom? Yeah. So, so Wally, is your mom like actually here today or is she still traveling back? Oh, she's already in the store. Let me go get her. <laughs> oh, okay. Wow. Candy store. Oh, okay. Hey, mom, mumsy, someone wants to meet you. His head is shaped like a gumdrop, so you can't miss him. What? My trunk is getting so excited. Grass flavor? Can you believe it? Whoa. Hey, I heard someone wanted to meet me. What? 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 Hi, hi Aunt Desi. It's great to have you back from your vacation. Aunt Desi? So, you're Wally's mother? Sure am, but you can call me Desi, short for Decimate. Du, du, du. Desi the dinosaur squirrel. Dinosaur squirrel? Okay, this is really confusing. Like, Wally is a walrus. How could you possibly be his mother? See, it's Wally squirrel, and I'm Desi squirrel. Same species, same last name. So yes, he's my little honey bunny. But, but, but this is so confusing. I don't even want to try to figure out what uh, Wally's father is. Okay, um, oh. okay, but there's another problem here. If, if you're a dinosaur, aren't you supposed to be extinct? Oh, Pastor Steph, you need to follow along better. Of course dinosaurs are extinct, but Desi is a dinosaur squirrel. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, so I see you met my mumsy, Pastor Steph. Well, I sure did, even though I'm a little bit confused by how all this relates. Well, Pastor Steph, you're often confused. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I was telling Mumsy about how you have been teaching us about parachutes and how Jesus jumped out of a plane to challenge people's views on life and the world. Okay, Wally, you got sort of half of that right. Jesus did tell stories to challenge our views on the world. But they weren't called parachutes. Oh. They are called parables. Mm. And Jesus never jumped out of a plane. He didn't? No. No. Oh. He didn't. Wally told me these funny paragraphs that Jesus told about the farmer who threw his seeds all over the place and how it was about how different people respond to Jesus. I sure want to be like the good soil where the seeds grew up healthy and strong. What are some ways that these kids here can grow up healthy and strong in Jesus? Yeah, like what kinds of things can we do to water the seeds? Oh, I know. Do they need to eat lots of candy? Because the store is now open. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's great, but I don't think that eating lots of candy is going to help us grow closer to Jesus. 
But you know, there are things that we can do. And some of the things that we can do is being part of a good church community like this, where you get together with friends, you learn about Jesus, you have fun, and you grow, you have teachers and mentors that take you through things. And so, and you know what, actually, we are going to have a couple of kids dedicated today. And in the dedication, we remind ourselves of this. We remind ourselves that as parents and as a church family, we dedicate ourselves to saying we want to be a community where kids can grow and learn about Jesus in a safe and a fun place. And we also dedicate our kids to Jesus when we do that. So would you guys like to watch that? Would you? Yeah. Would you, would you uh, squirrels like to watch that? Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is you guys are going to go back to your parents right now. We're not going to dismiss you yet, and we're going to watch this, and we're going to have a child dedication with a couple of families. So you guys can go back, and I am going to call those families up right now. Um, There we go. David and Wei Lin and Philip and Chantel, if you guys want to come up right now on the stage. You can come on both sides of me here. So this is very special that we are going to be doing this on Mother's Day. So we've got uh, Philip and Chantel on this side, and this is Evelyn right here. So Evelyn, oh, I like your all little balls on your necklace there. And we're going to be dedicating Evelyn to Jesus today. And we also have David and Wei Lin, and we've got Eli, and we're also going to be dedicating Eli to Jesus today. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to ask both of you sets of parents a few questions. And then after we do that, I'm going to ask the congregation some questions as well. And you guys are going to stand at that point. And so I'll just instruct you through that. So believing that your child is a gift from God and recognizing your responsibility as parents of your child, do you covenant with God today to raise your child to fear, and to love the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you pray for them? And will you teach them God's word and the way of salvation? Will you instruct them to be a godly follower of Jesus Christ and to live their lives fully dedicated to Jesus? And will you today, in the presence of God and his church family, commit to these things? And we want to support them as a congregation. And so we want to be the kind of church environment that does this. And so why don't we stand together? And I'm going to ask you now as a congregation these same questions. So believing that children are a gift from God and recognizing your responsibility as a church, do you covenant with God today to be the kind of community where these children can grow in a way that they will fear and love God? Will you pray for them? And will you teach them God's word and the way of salvation by your actions and by your words? Will you instruct them to be godly followers of Jesus Christ and to live their life fully dedicated to the glory of God? And will you today in the presence of God and in the presence of these families commit to these things? Let's bow our heads and let's pray. And can I have the kids come closer to me? I'm going to pray a blessing on you guys. So you just stand right here. All right, let's pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these treasured children. Although you have entrusted them to us as a gift, we know that they belong to you. Just like Hannah offered Samuel, we dedicate them to you. We recognize that they are always in your care. Lord, send your Holy Spirit daily to lead, guide, and to counsel both Eli and Evelyn. Always assist them to grow in wisdom, stature, grace, knowledge, kindness, and compassion, and love. May these children serve you faithfully with their whole hearts devoted to you all the days of their life. May they discover the joy of your presence through a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Keep them walking on the path that leads to eternal life. 
Help them to overcome the temptations of this world and the sin that can so easily entangle. And we look forward with great anticipation to the day these children decide on their own to follow you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, I want to give each of you guys... Here, Evelyn, I'm going to give that so you can remember this day and you can hold on to that and give it to your parents. And same with you, Eli, you can take that there. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you guys. Thank you. Do you guys want, yeah, why don't we come together on this side? We'll come on this side. We'll get a, we'll get a picture with everybody here. And you, you may be seated. You want to look at Grandma Eli right there? <laughs> All good? Good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes. And we will dismiss the children at this time. You guys can go off to Sunday school. Just want to draw your attention to a few announcements. Uh, one of the things is we always put money aside in our budget so that we can hire some students and give some students some, uh, some work and some experience uh, in our church. And we have hired a student on a part-time basis for the summer. Uh, he is a graduate from Douglas College in the area of sound and mixing and production. And so I want to just draw attention. He didn't know I was going to do this, but back there in the sound booth is Bryce. Why don't you wave, Bryce? Uh, Bryce is going to be helping our sound team out uh, on Thursday nights with our practices and on Sunday mornings and just uh, continuing to just enhance uh, that whole area of ministry. So Bryce, thanks so much for, for being with us and being part of us for the next number of months here. Uh, we also just want to let you know that we have some upcoming events. You know about the Ukrainian breakfast. An email went out on that. If you would like to sign up and help, just look at the email, and there is a Google Doc on there that you can sign up either to help in the kitchen or to help with setting up chairs or cleaning everything up after. If you're not sure how to do all that but you are interested, just go to the welcome station after in the foyer, and you can talk to them there, and they will get you all signed up for one of the aspects of that. And they can even tell you what some of the different roles are. Uh, also, on your way out today, it is Mother's Day, and we have a gift for all of our mothers. And so, uh, Nancy, I'm going to give this to you as a demonstration of giving a gift to a mother. So there you go. Now, now more will be done for Nancy than just this. I just want you to know that. But um, yeah, make sure you grab those uh, uh, after the service for all mothers and grandmothers. We also are starting a campaign here today on Mother's Day that's going to go from Mother's Day to Father's Day. And it is, we're going to play a video here so you'll get more information about it. And it's the Baby Bottle Campaign. You can, there's two organizations that we're supporting that do very similar things. And so you can either donate online to one of the organizations or you can grab one of the baby bottles and they're out in the back there. Take it home and fill this up with change and then bring this back on Father's Day. And that will be going to the same cause with a different organization. So to let you know a little bit about what all this baby bottle stuff is about, we are going to play a video. We'll take the offering during the video as well. And then you can get a bit of an understanding and then make sure you grab these on your way out. Hi, my name is Mason. I'm going to tell you a quick story, then why it's important. This is Jim. Jim is a big fan of Hope for Women Pregnancy Center, but he didn't know how to support them. One day at church, Jim heard about a baby bottle fundraiser. He thought, I can fill a baby bottle with change. So he grabbed a bottle from his church, then went into his wallet. He grabbed a couple coins and a $5 bill. He was off to a great start. Now Jim just needed a few other ways to fill his bottle. He decided he could look through his couch. And he also looked through his car, but it still wasn't enough. So he got some cans. 
On his way home from dropping off those cans, Jim decided to get a coffee. When the cashier handed him some change, he thought, hmm, this is a great way to fill up my baby bottle. Jim made sure to go a few extra times that week. Like 36 times. <laughs> that Sunday, Jim was proud to come to church with a full baby bottle with $27 of change. Now, here's why the story is important. You see, Jim wasn't the only one doing this. He had a whole community with him. And together, they raised almost $40,000. For this fundraiser to work, we need everyone to chip in, which means we need your help. You can fill a bottle too. You just need to collect cash, checks, or even a credit card number. You can also go on to babybottles.ca and fill up your virtual bottle there. Help support Hope for Women. Fill a bottle, save a life. I actually thought the video was going to uh, say a little bit more about what it is uh, about. And so essentially, uh, these are organizations that support and help women that have found themselves pregnant, and it's an unwanted pregnancy, or maybe a teenager that has found themselves pregnant, and want to keep their baby and to help walk them through the steps, uh, even financially, emotionally, uh, with counseling, and different types of uh, things like that. So the money goes towards all of that. Uh, that's why it's saving lives. It's saving these babies lives so that these mothers can bring them to full term and then to begin to raise these children. So that's what the Pregnancy Counseling Center and these organizations are about. Uh, we are working through the parables of Jesus and uh, today's parable, like all the parables, is uh, one that kind of strikes us strange, uh, trying to figure out what exactly Jesus is saying. Now, there have been a couple of times that Nancy has been in the middle of baking a cake when she realizes that she has no eggs. And on those occasions, she's sometimes said to me, Steph, can you run to save on foods? I need some eggs. Uh, sometimes, instead of going to save on food, what I've actually done is I've just gone right over my lawn and I've knocked on my neighbor's door and I've said to my neighbor, hey, Steve, uh, do you have a couple of eggs I can borrow? And he's always been very willing to comply and give me a couple of eggs. I've never even had to give the eggs back. Uh, well, obviously, I couldn't give those eggs back, but I, I've never had to return the eggs with new eggs. And, and he's returned the favor. Uh, there have been times a while back, I remember, we were having a barbecue in our backyard with a bunch of friends, and suddenly I heard the doorbell ring, and I went to the door, there was Steve, and Steve said to me, hey, Steph, do you have a bottle of ketchup I can borrow? And no problem, went to the fridge, gave him the bottle of ketchup, just no big deal. I didn't even care if he even gave me that bottle of ketchup back, and that's just simply what friends do. But something happens to me in the middle of the night. Now, if my neighbor Steve were to ring my doorbell in the middle of the night, the first thing I would think is it's an emergency. I mean, this is serious. And so I would, I would want to be there. I would get up and I'd be like, Steve, what do you need? If after ringing my doorbell in the middle of the night, Steve said to me, hey, do you have a bottle of ketchup I can borrow? I would not be impressed. I would tell him to go away. I know that's not very nice, but it, it may be unique to me, but I find that I have a little less of the Holy Spirit in me at about 2 a.m. in the morning when my neighbor is ringing my doorbell. Now, if I told him to go away, and if he still came, and I tried to go back to bed, and he still came back, and he rang my doorbell again, and again, and again, and again, and kept knocking on my door, and then started calling me so that it was so loud that it woke up my kids, and it started waking up my neighbors all through the cul-de-sac, I would be really unimpressed. I would have a lot less of the Holy Spirit than I already have at two in the morning when that started to happen. Oh, I would get up at that point and I would get him his ketchup. I would probably unscrew the lid and maybe put some pepper in it or something like that. Um, but just to shut him up, I would get him his ketchup. There is a reason in the Bible 
that it says in the proverb, if anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. The Bible knows what it's talking about. I learned the truth of this verse very early on in my marriage to Nancy. See, my wife does not love me very much before 9 a.m. She only starts loving me around 9 a.m., and then as the day goes on, she loves me more and more and more. And I've learned to just accommodate that. That's just the way that she is. And so goes the story of another one of Jesus's humorous and also perplexing parables. If you want to follow along, it's in Luke chapter 11. And we're going to read the parable that starts in verse 5 of Luke chapter 11. Now, Jesus sets up what this parable is is about by saying, then, teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Okay, so we know that this story is going to tell us something about prayer. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, Don't bother me, the door is locked for the night, and my family are all in bed, I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. I mean, what a story. (laughs) Guy comes, middle of the night, I don't know why he has friends coming to visit him at midnight. He has some friends coming to visit at midnight. He needs some bread, doesn't have any, goes to his neighbor's house. And then his neighbor says, leave me alone, I'm in bed. And then he just keeps shamelessly knocking. And then as Jesus even says, not because of friendship's sake, but just to make him go away, he'll finally give in and give him the bread. What does this have to do with prayer? Jesus' disciples come and ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. And right before this, he starts by giving them the Lord's Prayer as a basic structure of the kinds of things that we can pray for. And some instruction on what to know what to pray for. And then we read, teaching them more about prayer, he uses this story. And then Jesus launches into the story of the annoying neighbor. It starts off with this beautiful, teach us to pray, Jesus, and then he teaches this beautiful prayer, the Lord's Prayer, that we still to this day in many churches say regularly, even in part of our liturgy. And then he launches into a story that's not nearly as beautiful as the prayer. In fact, it's kind of a weird story that makes you ask all kinds of questions as what is the point? What is this supposed to teach us about prayer? That we are to keep on pestering God with our requests until he finally gives in so that we'll leave him alone? Is this what it's trying to tell us? That God has to hear our prayers over and over and over and over and over again before God will finally say, sure, fine. Not because of friendship's sake, but because you've annoyed me long enough, here you go. Seems a strange message. And it also seems like a game. That you have to reach a certain number before God will listen to your prayers. So one prayer is not good enough you got to pray 20 times. And then you, you, you sort of fill up the prayer bucket. The, the bucket has to slowly fill up until it gets to the top and it overflows. And, and it's, it's a really deep bucket. So even your 20 prayers is probably going to take a long time if you go at that pace. And so what you need to do is not only do you not need to pray one time, but you need to pray 20 times, but you got to get 20 friends to pray also. And if you can get your 20 friends to also pray 20 times, that adds up to 400 prayers. And so if God's being pestered 400 times by 20 people, he's even more willing to finally give in. I mean, 
as weird and as unsettling as that sounds, we do sometimes think about prayer this way. We can just get more people to pray more times, more fervently. Then God will finally give in. And then we'll go to a parable like this and say, see, this is what Jesus even taught. But what I want to say to you this morning is this is precisely what this parable can't mean. This is not what the parable is teaching. It can't be what the parable is teaching because this kind of prayer is more reflective of superstition or a pagan way of praying. It directly contradicts what the Lord teaches us about prayer elsewhere and even the Lord's prayer. Jesus says elsewhere, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. Your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Now, if we're going to let Scripture interpret Scripture, uh, you've got to somehow put those two together. And obviously, one of the ways of understanding Scripture to interpret Scripture is clearer Scripture has to interpret less clear scripture. So here you've got a very clear scripture. Jesus is giving a very clear teaching about prayer. The other one is a story. Stories are meant to be interpreted. So how does the story of the persistent annoying neighbor knocking on the door over and over and over and over again until the neighbor finally gives in as a story about prayer, how does that fit with Jesus saying, don't babble on and on and on? God knows what you need before you even come knocking on your door. Don't think that by merely repeating your words over and over and over again, that somehow is honoring to God. In fact, the story is teaching the opposite of that. Just like what Jesus is teaching here. So the parable of the annoying neighbor can't be about God answering our prayers because we pester him. That turns prayer into magic. And if there's anything that the Bible is against, it's against superstition and magic and any kind of way thinking that we can manipulate the gods or God through our means. It destroys and paints a very derogatory picture of God's character. So I've been preaching for about 25 years now. Uh, probably about once a week, sometimes if not more. So I was like adding it up a, a little while ago and I'm like, man, I, I've preached like you know, 1,300 sermons. And one of the things I could say about when putting those sermons together is unlike, and we've mentioned this a little bit before in some of our earlier sermons about the parables, unlike what people think about the parables, I find the parables the most difficult thing in the Bible to preach about. They are the things that take the most work to figure out and to get into trying to understand what they mean and what Jesus is working with them. They're not these simple stories with easy morals in the end. In fact, like this particular one today, if you take it as an easy story with a knee-jerk reaction to, oh, I know what that means, you end up interpreting it completely wrong and you get a wrong perspective of God. This is echoed in what Eugene Lowry says in his book, How to Preach a Parable. Now, when you look at that book, you can tell by the creativity that went into the book cover how interesting the book is, which I find quite ironic because parables are tremendously interesting, and so they could have worked a little bit on marketing the, the book there. But in the opening lines... Of this book here, which is written primarily to pastors and preachers, he says right in the very opening, preachers often shy away from preaching on the parables, believing that they are too difficult for the average preacher 